Welcome back guys to Coal Town. Um, today we're going to be going over elixir management and how to count elixir as has been requested in the past. This is something most pro players have a really good grasp on because it's a really key concept of the game. It allows you to be a lot riskier with like predictions and to just expect your opponent to do one thing or the other. Um, this ties in with card counting as well. Uh, which you should be able to do both, but first we'll just focus on Elixir. I may make a card, card counting video if you guys request that as well. I've done one in the past, but uh, trying to be a little bit more concise uh, and more up to date. So first off, we're going to talk about the basics of counting Elixir, uh, how to teach yourself the skill, and then like practice techniques. So I'm just going to hop into a game, and then I'll tell you about some stuff as uh, we get into it. But uh, first off, the basis of counting Elixir is something you'll see in-game. So this is obviously like an ex like not a useful situation, but um, you generate elixir the same amount unless they have elixir pump up, um, and then you have to take that into your calculation. Uh, and elixir pump generates two elixir, um, and if you spell it with fireball or poison, it trades evenly, <clears throat> and it's it's like they won't get the two elixir. You just stay even. You don't they get, don't get an advantage anymore. Um, I'll pause this for a second while I talk though. Um, so th the basics are like. Like simple addi addi addition and subtraction, like you need to learn how much every troop costs, and then as they play troops, um, you don't necessarily have to keep an exact count. Like I'm never counting like, oh, this is five, that's five, whatever. But if so something interacts, if I realize, if an inferno, for example, if if you play a bowler in the back and you push the other lane, it kind of goes even, and then an inferno dragon kills your bowler. Um, for free because of course boy doesn't fight back that's a positive one elixir trade on that inferno dragon but it's not just a positive one elixir trade because then you have to defend that inferno dragon so he got plus one on that interaction and then whatever you defend it with and it can go on and on like if you're if your troop then survives like if i play an electro whiz then it survives and counter pushes they have to answer that but if it's something like oh i have to like ice whiz it and they kill each other then now you just went down four elixir because you let a bowler die and then you let an ice whiz die um so that's that's when you get a a baseline for like oh I'm up or down and that's just something you get better at the more you play if you actually focus on it if you actually focus on how the troops interact and how one person gets ahead in that manner you you start to realize that you know when you're up or when you're down um, and then we'll, we'll kind of go to like a part where it's more obvious um, so that's just something that you like you get as you play more and more um, but uh, this is a weird deck this dude was running but we're going to skip to like the next part, and this happens quite a few times a game, and this is really important. Alright, so if you if you notice, um, what's going to happen here, uh, I, I knew when he pumped up that he had a lead, but you could you could tell by how he played, like how, he, how early he played it, because I wasn't that far down, that he played it at 6 elixir. Good players will play their pumps at 10 elixir, but just in general, um, when you're in, the pumps people get a little more antsy, but when you're playing just normal games... Both players, there's no reason to play a troop at the back when you're at, at 8 elixir. If you are doing it, like, maybe you throw off a really good player, but even then it doesn't really matter. Um, because now you're just kind of wasting a troop early on, and it's like you're not going to be able to support it as well. So most people will wait till they're at 10 elixir to play a troop in the back. That is what you should do um, after these after pushes go down and you reset. Um, so when you get to 10 elixir, you should realize and you should reset your count at that moment. You should know whether you're up or down. So at this point, I'm not the 10 elixir yet. He, he played a pump already, but I already knew that, that his, his other pump is going to generate like three or four more. And then this pump will generate a two elixir lead. Um, so I, I know at this point, counting the pump he just put down, that I'm, I'm down quite a bit. Um, which is expected because that was an awful start for me. Uh, partially because of starting hand. But uh, you, you take that knowledge and you use it every single game. Like There are like two or three times every single game where both players with the 10 elixir. And if you play a card first at the back, then you are up however many elixir you had to wait until they played a card or vice versa. So that's, that's something you should do every single game. That is something you should always do is reset your count based on these lapses in the game. Um, also, if you're you, once you get into card tracking, you should be tracking their cycle at that moment. It, it gives you like five to ten seconds where you truly have just this time to yourself to figure out what deck they're running um how much elixir you're down or up and what four cards they have in their hand right now that's something that like pros do that you get better at the more you play um and as far as like practice techniques um for this you should really get to where you're thinking about this every single game especially in those lapses so that's just something you can actively like train yourself to do because it's not something you just magically acquire you have to work at it 
Um, and the other thing is you can go into classic challenge where the opponents aren't as difficult. Um, and you can just play an entire game where you're only thinking about whether you think you're up or down an elixir. Um, and don't worry about winning because this is all about training your ability to count elixir in, like faster than just like passively. Um, just playing normally so you actually go into a classic challenge and this is something like i don't need to do for example because i always have a pretty good like uh hand on who's up or down as a matter of fact i've done it with my teammates before and we are both able to stay within zero to one elixir at almost all times um so it's not necessarily relative to just track exactly what it is but you should have like a good idea and in these classic challenges you don't care whether you win or lose you just kind of play like on autopilot and then just focus on thinking, okay, am I up or down? Am I up or down? Um, and then just kind of like uh, either record yourself or just like take a mental note of what you said at what time and then go back to the replay and watch it and see whether you're right or wrong and like adjust from that point forward and do this every now and then and you'll eventually get much better at it. All right, so next we're going to talk about um, just some examples of when people overcommit with spells this is really common and something you need to recognize if you're doing um, and this is something you can learn from so a common example is when I mean this goes for like almost any offensive push but uh, you can really help yourself if you don't do this as much All right, so here is the scenario. You're a graveyard player, and this is mainly in single elixir because in double elixir, it's okay to do this. But this is why spells aren't quite... If, if you're being really aggressive and you don't have just counter-pushing units already, it's not quite as good to use spells offensively. So here's the scenario. like um, you They use poison, so you want to go in for an offensive graveyard. So you, you use your mini tank or whatever, and then... Um, Let's say they end up playing minion horde, and maybe you were even lower than this, and you end up poisoning. Um, in like this scenario, it would be okay, I guess. But the problem is, um, a lot of the time you'll see people. Okay, so let's like with this bully, for example. Like you'll see people spamming it before they have the elixir to play it. So yeah, so let, let, let's say I go with um, maybe even in a more expensive push or something, and or maybe I have to defend at the same time as I'm going in with a graveyard push. Or maybe I put down that ghost, they go opposite lane battle ram, I have to play electro wizard, and then I graveyard, and then, um, and, and that's another overcommitment is graveyarding with that ghost because you're, you don't have the elixir to push right then. That's why graveyarding early game, especially with these heavier graveyard decks, is risky. But overall, so you, let's say you do graveyard and you're playing against three musk and they end up killing or they play minion horde on top of the ghost in the graveyard. So this is when like positive elixir trades can be deceptive um, because, yes, poison is a four for five trade, a positive one elixir trade. But if you're using poison on a troop, so you have to think of it this way. So troops, when they kill other troops, they have achieved value. Um, so this is kind of the same as when I use that Inferno Dragon example, or if I haven't used it already, I don't remember what order this video is going to be in. Um, so, uh, and killing a bowler or whatever. When, when you're using um, troops, you have to think of them as having a tamed value or not. So if a minion horde clears out a graveyard in an ice golem or a graveyard in a ghost and takes minimal damage, um, it has already achieved value. That minion horde was played for 5 elixir and it countered 5 elixir plus 3 elixir. So 3, that's a positive 3 elixir trade for the minion horde player. But then you're going ahead and, or even if it's ice golem, it's only a positive 2 trade. And now they have a counter pushing minion horde that may be slightly damaged from the ice golem or whatever. Um, but now you're poisoning, and you're poisoning late. So in, in, in double elixir, when you can play this poison, as soon as the minion horde is played, it's great because it kills the minion horde, and your skeletons will then continue to attack the tower, and maybe you get tower. Um, so this is, this is a good example of using a, a spell because you're augmenting your push, and you're allowing it to survive and achieve uh, more tower damage. But if that minion horde has already done its job and killed everything and already achieved value, it not only was a free like expenditure for the the player that played the minion horde, it then kills everything and it, it's basically a card that gained them elixir. Um, that's kind of how you have to think of this these types of interactions. And then if you poison it, you're killing a card that's already gained elixir, so you're going down four more. So in our example, if they if we used ice golem graveyard um, and the minion horde kills it all before we have time to play poison. 
and then we're spam clicking the poison and then it comes out late it means they're already up to elixir and then we just gave them four more instead what you're supposed to do in this situation is you wait and you like play an ice wizard on defense and yes ice wizard is only one elixir less but what this does is the ice wizard then kills the minion horde and is now a troop that counter pushes this is why you have to know when to spell and when not to spell because spells they don't give you anything and they don't return value if they're if you're using them they need to be getting value in the moment so like killing a minion horde is value if you kill it and have other troops survive or if it hasn't achieved value already if someone plays a minion horde in the back which is stupid but if someone plays a minion horde in the back it's okay because it's a positive one electric trade yes but you have to think about the circumstance of which you're playing it and if um if that card has already achieved value, then it's usually a bad expenditure, and you should just focus on defending and having counter pushing troops. Like with an Ice Wiz, um, Electric Wiz, not necessarily, because if you plop it on top, it's dying anyway. Um, so Ice Wiz or like NATO would be the like proper choices there. Um, another example is just going in for like a giant push. Um, let's say. Let's say, another example against like 3 Musk. Let's say you go in for a giant push, you overcommit, you you throw down on a giant and a mega minion for some reason without knowing what their hand is, um, and then they just defend it with a 3 Musk. Um, and then you played it right when you are at 8 Elixir, that fireball is going to come super late. It's not going to fully kill the uh, Musketeers anyway. Um, so th even though it's like, I mean, maybe with Musketeers you swing it anyway. Let let's just use Minion Horde again, I guess. You Don't fireball it late, cause, um, especially don't fireball something... Um, yeah, just late. I mean, any push this goes for you. Like the the the, the graveyard example is really good. But any any offensive decks. Um, oh, this is oh hog. Let's go with hog. Let's go with hog. Um, so you go with a hog at the start of the game, and then they goblin gang. You weren't expecting that goblin gang, so the odds are your log is going to be incredibly late. Um, and your hog's already going to die. Your hog's not going to get any more hits as a result. Late game and double, double elixir, it's always okay to do this because it's like you're getting damage anyway and you're going to have enough elixir to defend. But in single, you're not going to get elixir back quickly. And if they're smart, you just went uh, six for three and only got one hog swing. Um, now they're up three elixir and that's like it's an unnecessary lead that you're giving them you're better off just letting your hog die going down one elixir and then defending with a counter pushing troop that then threatens them and makes them answer it um, this keeps you much closer in elixir and on equal terms as opposed to just over committing with a spell that's not going to do anything other than get a little bit of damage um, because like i said that goblin gang has already achieved value same with if it was minion horde and you use fireball on a hog push you have to think about using spells um, and double elixir is great um, or using them with really fast reaction times but usually not to open the game um, because then it's a lot riskier and I wouldn't predict it because it's like you don't know what their deck is this is why you kind of play a slow early game because otherwise you can give out unnecessary leads um, yeah so that's a that's a really big thing that I see a lot of people do is just not using spells correctly um, and then being over aggressive with them early game that's something I notice a lot when I'm coaching um, all right, so next, knowing how to properly manage Elixir. Uh, we talked about spell usage already um, and positive Elixir trades or like when that is a good thing. Um, just make sure you're always thinking of troops as a resource um, and and whether they've achieved value or not. Uh, this can be hard to like implement instantly, but just think about it when you're playing because um, you're better off saving and then using a defensive troop in some situations, especially early game, than you are just like straight out spelling. Uh, once you have all the elixir in the world and double elixir, sure, go for it. Um, but one, in the single elixir, sometimes just let it go. Don't use your spell on that unit, even if it's good. Uh, especially for bait type decks. So like throwing out a fireball, um, like a hog. Okay, so you go hog, they go minion horde, you fireball it. Um, even if you get an extra hog swing, that's not necessarily a good thing because they could have a pump and then they could have three musk and you have no punish for either because you just use your one condition and your spell. So yeah, be really careful with like early aggression spell wise. That's a really big mistake I see a lot of people make. Um, yeah, so think of them, the cards on the field. Oh, and the other thing is just like, um, and, and take into account when you're like, once you like, have learned to count elixir, that the troops on the field, especially if they're troops that are threatening on offense, those are basically elixir. So, all right, so here we are. Uh, yeah, I messed with my setup and blah, blah, blah. But we're gonna, yeah, I'm wearing a different shirt because it's a different day, but we're gonna ignore that. Um, so, we are gonna be so now we're gonna move in, gonna be moving on to like showing like examples of real gameplay to like talk about elixir management and these concepts and everything. So uh, let's go ahead and skip to the part I'm talking about. 
so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking more about like, yeah, so the application of it, showing you guys, so you, it's less of me jabbering and you can actually uh, hear the stuff I'm talking and, and understand it and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so yeah, so I talked earlier about the concept of taking damage um, or knowing when you... Uh, so like right here, I'm going opposite lane, blah, blah, blah. Um, but n knowing when you can't defend something or you or it's it's pointless or that you'll benefit more from just ignoring um and netting an elixir lead through the health of your tower uh, so we, we stuff like that that i was uh, talking about earlier which is typically better to do with like heavier decks that have really strong pushes so i'm not necessarily playing beat down right now but this is one where it can be um okay so something i'll pause right here I'm up through elixir, and I should know this because I had like a positive defense, and I'm sh I, I do know this. Um, and he has been cart counting card cycle well. He knows that all my um, air defenses are out of hand. So what I see some people do sometimes is they see this balloon, they look at their hand, or like I have to poison it, I have to band it on top of it for some reason, and then I can e whiz. But the thing is, you're not gonna have enough elixir. So what I recognize is I'm already up elixir. And he just threw down a balloon. I don't have the air counters. That's okay. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stack a push. And there's no way, there's no way he defends this because he doesn't have the elixir to do so. Um, even if he had gone, it didn't really matter what he went with there. Um, I, I would have came through just because I had so much of an elixir lead on him. He even has arrows for minions and everything. Um, and then, yeah, so that's one elixir decision that... Uh, makes a bad situation i mean partially my fault for not having all the air counters i needed in the hand but also my good by recognizing um that he was down an elixir and i could punish it and there was no reason to try to panic and defend i mean of course there's not well i also played it at the back so i could have like a significant push um i guess i think the result maybe would have been the same if i'd gone in the middle uh but yeah uh just punishing then here's a halfway decent defense blah 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 Da -da. So this is really aggressive by him. So this is like another elixir management thing. Obviously, you can't get three or you can't lose your tower. Um, but he pushed into and my Mega Knight didn't die. Um, so I have a lot of value here and I have a really strong counter push. And so I pressure the left side. But then I, I realize um, or I recognize that he's really low on elixir. Um, and this is just like knowing when you can punish and when you can't. So uh, I'm able to apply this. And oh, so here's here's applying the concept of playing a card as soon as you have the elixir to play it so this is something that you should be recognizing so he played that mega minion as soon as he had a three elixir and i know that because it comes out at like a really weird time kind of like obviously he would have played it earlier if he could have like he wants to play everything together not one by one and then and then you can see he just throws down this tombstone at the last second um so this is partially knowing that tombstone is a good counter to mega knight but instead of starting it at the back because i know tombstone's out of hand and i know that i'm also still ahead in elixir i'm going all out and I went with an Inferno Dragon, which is normally a weird offensive play. Also because I knew his guards were out of hand, but also because Tombstone's out of hand. So it's like, and I have an Elixir lead because he's playing these cards the last possible second. So I know um, he's at zero and I'm at whatever Elixir I was at. And I was at like six or whatever, so I'm up a ton. So that's the, one of the moments where you can punish really hard because of how, how, high, uh, uh, how large of an Elixir lead you have. Um, and that's just coming down to the concept of recognizing that they're playing cards the last possible second as soon as they get the elixir for it this is something that um you can recognize when people spell late you can recognize when they play defensive counters that would have been better to play earlier um and, and that's something you really need to take advantage of if you're in the position to punish it all right so next up this is um this is something that i was watching live at the world finals that um <clears throat> has stuck with me in my memory for a long time um and at the time, I, I couldn't see the, I wasn't, I was watching the gameplay on the big screen. I wasn't watching Sergio's reaction, but this is 100% a combination of this play that you're about to see Sergio make at the World Championships and something that I thought was really impressive at the time, but I thought maybe, I thought, wow, why did he go in? So, oh, not necessarily why did he go in so hard, but we'll, we'll kind of go forward to it right here. But, um... This is a combination of Sergio knowing this matchup really well, being really good with the deck, and absolutely um, counting Elixir. So he he okay. So if you if you look, so this is kind of like where he's waiting to get to ten Elixir, and you can see that Tally is only like a fourth of Elixir ahead. And what you uh, will see him do is Sergio knew that he was. Um, 
through either like feeling or just being really good at elixir counting sergio knew that he was dead even in elixir with tally and what he does next will show you this and it's it's a perfect example of knowing card rotation partially yes um but also tracking the habits of an opponent and then punishing them through the knowledge of elixir so he knows he he's even um, and tally, and this is a good play in the majority of the time in this in, in a mirror match in any game, it's double elixir, so tally is gonna play his Mega Knight at the back, and this is what Sergio will do. He knows he's even. He knows that Tally is about to play his Mega Knight at the back, and he want and because because it makes sense, right? But Bo both are pushing into the left side lane. So Tally is gonna play a Mega Knight at the back to slowly push into the left side lane. Watch what Watch what Sergio just did. And and look at his reaction. Sergio knew exactly what he was doing when he planted this because he knew that Tally had one major counter to Bandit in a tight situation, and that's Mega Knight. And he knew that as a result, and not only does he play Bandit going out on a gamble, he 100% knew with this timing that Tally was about to play Mega Knight, and he's punishing it with a Bandit minions. And he knows that in this situation, the only counter that, like, that Tally is going to be able to do that's effective is Electro Wizard. And in this matchup, Electro Wizard is incredibly key because you need Electro Wizard to stop Inferno Dragon from killing a Mega Knight. So, while this play doesn't 100% win him the game right here because he doesn't take the tower, what you see is Tally over, well, he not over commits, but he's so shocked that he has to go Electro Wizard and bats. And as a result, this Inferno Dragon shreds Tally's uh, Mega Knight. Uh, and this is also, and then Sergio has his own Electro Wizard, and as a result, Sergio has a massive counter push. And this play may look like, well, Sergio just defended and then went Electro Wizard, but this play was 100% set up by Sergio putting that Bandit minions on the opposite side and pressuring and surprising Tally into doing something that he didn't want, and then giving him a ton of value on his Inferno Dragon. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is something that like every time I've thought about making an elixir, uh, elixir counting video, this has like been the play that's been in my mind because that was a hundred percent, um, that was a hundred percent him knowing the elixir count of his opponent and then punishing perfectly as a result. And it ends up winning him the game, uh, single-handedly almost. Of course, then he plays correctly on defense and then gets a huge counter push, but baiting out the proper card as a result of elixir management was the reason Sergio made uh, had that victory and I was really impressed. That was really well played. Um, that's, that's, that's what it's all about. Like that's what sets the best players from the ones that are just good. Yeah. I mean, so next just like think of the cards themselves as elixir. Um, so like if you defend with a P.E.K.K.A. and then have, um, a seven elixir card still on the field, relatively healthy on the counter push and you're up to elixir, um, that means you're not just up to elixir, you're up like nine basically. Um, if the Pekka is like really healthy and it's something that you should definitely use uh, in that situation, or if you're down like four, but you have a Pekka, it's like okay, you have a threat, maybe push with it a little bit or focus on cycling back to it if they have like a tank. It just depends on the situation, all right. So, next, we're going to talk about how different decks use elixir leads differently. Um, so this is mainly going to be something with like different archetypes. So let's talk about it. So graveyard. So if you're counting elixir and you're doing a great job and you defend well and you get a lead or whatever, um, graveyard is the type of deck that, um, especially because this is kind of a poison bait. Um, this type of deck, this one specifically, is really good by building up a large push and winning bridge battles. So a lot of the time you can bait them out to attack things because um, they'll be antsy to not allow a graveyard. It's also about like baiting uh, poisons or, yeah, so I mean like you get a lead and then you just stack troops really because um, then it either baits them to poison it and then you get a graveyard. Or um, also another thing you can do is uh, with a graveyard, if you know that their counter is out of hand or if their counter is susceptible to poison, just go with a quick graveyard and uh, poison. Yeah, so um, the other ones are a little bit easier to explain. So going on through, um, I guess with like uh, like bait decks, um, really just with uh, elixir leads, um, you're gonna wanna just go in really aggressive uh, when like if anyone's ever down, especially if it's off of a defense, just you just spam all your swarm in front of it. Not all together where they get a ton of value, but you you try to s space them out and just go in and be really aggressive because these are really aggressive decks usually without big spells. Um, so it's all about just being uh, and punishing um, and then also like if you're against beatdown you always punish really hard opposite lane with these types of decks um, 
we'll talk about i mean this isn't like goblin barrel but for like bait decks um you're gonna want to keep track of log mainly or whatever like their main counter is to goblin barrel and then uh again in some matchups if you have elixir lead it's good like rocket cycle late game especially if the tower's really low already and you got a lot of chip and then just keep people on their keep people on edge and then always try to punish spells uh you're going to want to be going opposite lane um early game if possible if it's against like a heavy deck and you're going to want to focus on defending and then just throwing in barrels whenever they don't have the elixir to respond to them so like first you want log to be out of the cycle and then like it's not bad to throw a goblin barrel like at the same time as someone's offensive push if it's going to get a lot of uh, damage on their uh tower um so next up we'll talk about hog which is really nice um i would say bridge spam first i guess um and then we'll talk about three months later so for for bridge spam it's really just defending and counter pushing um if, if you know you're up then you can just spam the bridge that's about all there is to it it's it, if it gets ahead it's really good at just punishing but never give them too much spell value you have to pay attention to their counters blah 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 so um on hog hog is really odd and and this is true of like several like cheap cheaper decks um hog is fast and it's punishing and it doesn't need a ton of support unlike like a giant or a golem so what you do with hog is so so we're talking about like elixir leads right so say you're up two or three elixir if you're up two or three elixir with um golem and we'll talk about this a little bit more or um especially golem or lava hound you just start a tank in the back because it means your opponent doesn't have the elixir to punish or if they do punish especially if your tower is already low on the other side um you can then leverage that further let them take the tower your deck is better at taking a second tower anyway um and then continue but with hog um when you're up two or three elixir you're not waiting till 10 elixir to play your tank and to build up a massive push because that's not how hog functions let's say um you're up for elixir and their best counter is mini pekka well if you're up two or three elixir if you play that hog as soon as you get to four elixir your hog is going to get three swings before they're able to play their mini pekka um so if, if you're up with the hog it's really good to play hogs at low elixirs and you'll notice this a lot if you watch the gameplay of like jack who's the best 2.6 player um he's not usually you're never really playing your hog at 10 elixir i mean sometimes maybe but typically you're, you're wanting to punish when you have leads anyway you're wanting to punish when you're low um because it because hog is like really good by itself and really threatening because it's not slow and it doesn't give them much time to respond and you can punish these uh you can punish when you have elixir leads quite a bit so I would say the other thing is like notice what their counters are. So if they have bats and you have hog, it's like even if they're down two elixir, they can play bats and completely destroy it, especially because a lot of hog decks run log and like fireball. So what you do in this case is you save up till you have six elixir, especially if bats is their main counter, and then you go ice golem and then you do a hog push with like a hog behind ice golem that threatens them and maybe they have goblin gang and then you have a log or something. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a good example with hog. Continuing down the line, Giant is also another really good punish deck. Um, if anyone ever pumps or has a big elixir expenditure, always go like Giant Mega Minion opposite lane. Same as like Bridge Bam, if they ever have a big expenditure, you like hardcore rush um, as well. Or if you have an elixir lead, you can start a Giant in the back and wait and see what they do. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a mix between beatdown and pressure, so you have a lot of options with Giant. It's pretty hybrid in that way, uh, how, you, how you deal with like elixir. Um, so we'll talk about three musk next. So three musk when you have elixir vanager earlier, uh, three musk is kind of the weird deck in how you really try to snowball elixir leads. You don't necessarily try to use them immediately. Um, three musk is where if you get an elixir lead, um, especially if you have a quicker cycling version, you try to cycle back to another pump, and at that point they they either um, they either overcommit and push when they're actually down an elixir because that's what sometimes people will do like you get up a second pump and then they'll push with like a battle ram push or whatever and it's like easy for you to defend because you have so much elixir um, with three much just make sure that you defend like cheaply as possible and always try to defend the pumps um, three must is all about sacrificing tower HP for elixir leads early on um, protecting your pump against miners and everything is really important and then of course it has a lot of bait to deal with like and, and then also, even if it's not the best counter, like say you're playing like a minion horde version of three must, sometimes, even if you know your minion horde is going to get fireballed, as long as it gets a decent amount of value and kills the support troops before it dies, if they fireball it, then you just go with your second counter to kill like the tank, like a giant, for example, and then you get a pump up and they have no counter or they have minor and then you have to be ready to block it. And then you get back to another pump 
and then I, it just messes up their cycle. So it's really good to like bait out spells, and then you try to keep the elixir lead flowing and stacking. Um, and then once you get the double elixir, you try to make sure you have a, like a spell baited out, or you try to make sure you don't give them extra value, like with two musketeers onto a pump, and then you go in all in, and then you try to overwhelm on a single push. Um, and then you continue to go go in because usually three musts get a lot of value. So even if you're up in elixir, you usually don't lose that lead if you're pressuring the correct way against the correct. Like you have to know their cards and know what the best pushes are. Um, but usually you can maintain that lead. Um, so next we'll talk about, I mean, like Lava Hound and like Balloon decks. For like Balloon, it's more of a like a, a punish. It's a combination of knowing you're up. So if you're up like three Elixir and then, you know, they only have one air counter, you like instantly go in with like a minor Balloon and then have the, the counter to their counter ready, uh, like Zap for Bats or whatever. Um, and it can be a really good opposite lane punish deck. And then for Lava Hound, it's more like defend really effectively. Um, and then whenever their win condition is out of hand or you have an Elixir lead, you try to just get a push going or when their counters are out of hand or if they something that's I see a lot of good Lava Hound players is like if someone just cycles a Mega Minion in the back that's so if someone cycles a Mega Minion in the back one that's a really good air counter two if you play a Lava Hound just in the same lane at the back of this Mega Minion it basically if they don't offensively push into you which is kind of an overcommitment by them a lot of the times they usually end up wasting that mega minion that's three elixir down the drain because it just hit the it just hit the lava hound a few times and died a tower um and then it's an air counter out of hand so you usually are able to punish like a loom push push immediately so that's an example of taking advantage of both card rotation and elixir management because these are things i'm going to make a video on card rotation probably if you guys request it especially um but these are things that go hand in hand uh with 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 knowing how to play your deck correctly um something i see a lot of time with really good expo players is you're going to play the expo down um especially like in double elixir and then if, if you have like the cycle variant i mean most are pretty cycly um and their tank is out of rotation or if you get a slight elixir lead um like someone can have like a pekka or a mega knight or whatever but if you're able to keep on cycling and they have a slower cycle than you and you um keep on playing the expo at like seven elixir and then as soon as you play it you have like an ice golem or a log or skeletons or whatever is good you're counting their rotation as well um so you, you know what is able to counter their push and then your expo it shoots at things first so like and you're able to kill these units that they're playing especially if they don't have the elixir if you're playing it before like they have their seven elixir pekka um because you have a two or three lead and then it's able to lock on their force to play their less effective units and the expo kills them like an electro wizard um so you, and then you just keep on cycling keep on playing expos and they never get to the point where they can play their tank or it comes out uh, late and then you're able to account for it with like an offensive tesla or something so yeah uh, expo is all about getting to like the range where it can play expo plus one unit and then just keep it on this pressure and not enabling your opponent to ever get anything offensive going um, unless you mess up and don't use the correct troops because it is a little bit predictive and it can be difficult um, But that's like how it keeps up pressure against normal uh, units Oh, and I think it's really important to quickly throw in here as like an afternote that I was talking to Razor about this um, You only really want to do this when you have a lead and it's against like one of those matchups If you're against like giant for example You don't want to just be throwing your expo out at like six or seven elixir because then they're gonna throw down giant and You have no you don't have enough elixir to like have like you don't have the archers you don't have the tesla this is purely for when you're up like two or three elixir against these these decks that i, I mentioned like peko that you can punish it with um against like giants for example you're more going to be when you're even elixir with expo it's more going to be like cycling archers in the back than playing ice golem in front of it and then maybe going um an expo or if you know it's a giant just defending um and not going offensive at all so i'm not saying this is how you always play it. i'm saying that's one of the ways that you can punish when you're ahead because these are our notes about decks when you are ahead in elixir and you have the opportunity to punish and then just for all the various, I mean, we talked about like giants and stuff and that kind of ties in with like having minor as well um but then like minor controls it's uh, it's just weaving in miners when they don't have their counters and then trying to defend effectively. Um, a lot of time miner, um, especially like 2.9 miner goes in offensively, like for negative trades, but, um, it's so good at defense and you just have to like, um, so another deck that does that sometimes is like, um, of course like spell cycles and then miners it's just there's I, mean, I ice Wiz decks do this sometimes is you go in really offensive and then you just have a really defensive decks um and then just as a general tip you should always try to go into defensive mode when you recognize you're down in elixir we're talking about how to punish when you're up but when you're down in an elixir you really just play troops slowly in the back um 
and then just try to get a lead through defending because towers usually get you back up because they're defending. You'll take some damage, but you just try to minimize damage. Um, and another, so finally, another tip that I remember is uh, there are moments when you should leak elixir, and they're typically when you're ahead. Um, so let's say I've taken a tower. He has bridge spam, for example. Um, he has one side at... Mm, let's say 40% of the tower's HP, and the other tower is at 100%. Um, if you're the bridge fan player, sometimes what you can do is you can recognize that maybe your opponent is playing like their Electro Wizard in the back because they reach 10 Elixir, which is normal, and they play the Electro Wizard or whatever defensive unit, like mid-cost defensive unit, in the back on the side of the lower tower because they're assuming you're going to push into it. They reach 10 Elixir and they don't want to leak. Well, if you're the defensive player and you've already taken a tower, there's no reason to actually cycle cards um, when you hit 10 elixir because even if you have an elixir lead of one or two or three, you don't care. All you have to do is defend for like another minute. So in this situation, if you're the defending player, what you want to do is you can leak as long as you want. Make them go first. Make them go first. Make them spend elixir and then respond res uh, respond as a result. Because what really good players will do a lot of times when they're down is they'll just completely switch lane. They'll wait for you to play a unit um, like Electro Wizard or maybe something even more expensive. And they'll just bum rush the other side, which is smart because they have one of their key defensive units out of cycle. That key unit is going to go and die. You don't care about it because you've already lost a tower um, and you're just trying to take one. So don't be afraid to leak when you're ahead in order to just remain defensive because you don't need to be aggressive, especially if you're playing a one elixir deck uh, or a, a deck that only takes one tower um, as opposed to like a beatdown. Uh, so finally, we'll talk about like uh, also we'll talk about Golem. Um, so with with Golem, um, there are like two situations kind of if you're if you're using um, one that's kind of like a bait variant, like with a poison bait Golem. Um, if they ever use poison and they're down elixir, you're gonna want to go like Night Witch first and then Golem in front of it because this keeps them from cycling back to their poison. But if you're playing more of a normal golem or one with like pump in it, you're you're just trying to defend early game and then get pumps down, kind of like three musketeers. But you're trying to get pumps down, and then if you ever get an elixir lead um, by a ton, um, what you can do is you can um, either well if you're on even terms, a lot of times you'll just try to play golem and double, or you try to play it when their win condition is is out of hand, so they can't punish you. Um, and then, for example, so something that's really nice against Golem is, or with Golem is, if you're playing against Bridge Band, which is a very difficult matchup, if you are able to get like a three elixir lead and you just plop your Golem down on the, you just plop your Golem down on the side of your your strong tower and so like say they already got like half your like weak tower you just let the bridge pan because they're gonna go like battle ram or whatever or maybe maybe they think you're gonna defend and they go like battle ram lumberjack what you do is you just ignore it um because you already have a three elixir lead and they they just spent eight more elixir and then you just play like your baby dragon or whatever on the other side so it shoots everything on the left side but then sh goes behind your golem and then you try to three crown them um because you just had uh, like an eight of elixir plus a three elixir lead you're up 11 basically with a counter pushing baby dragon and they have to play inferno but then you have like your tornado your mega minion um and you try to three crown them uh because that's one of those it's a difficult matchup but if you can use your knowledge of how to abuse elixir you can win that way um by just completely sacrificing like a half hp tower um and you, so the so some yeah so sometimes with golem you're gonna want to start like the the golem on the weak side tower but in this example you would want to start it on strong side because you want them to take the tower and then just counter push uh, and make them waste that elixir if it was a good bridge band player they would only go um, battle ram because they would knew that you could maybe do that um, but that's an example of abusing elixir in like a tough matchup. Did post on Twitter last night asking if anyone had specific questions on this video before I posted it because uh, I was gonna edit in the morning. So we'll just quickly go through some um, like a Q and A section at the end here. So someone asked me how do pros practice. So we don't necessarily. So I talked about like practicing elixir counting earlier. That's more of like an intermediate um, intermediate thing you need to get down. Pros already know how to count elixir for the most part in card rotation. Um, some are better at it than others, but I mean it's something you get as you play at a high level. Um, and so for practicing practicing itself, I would say the most productive practices are just playing your teammates or other people um, that are good and like the the like 
the setup of leagues like RPL format, blah blah blah, or just playing best of threes, best of fives, but making sure you're playing like random decks and you're like you're learning from every loss and watching your replays. Um, that's really helpful. And then the other would just be like uh, practice. I mean, just playing um, against good players, really. Uh, and then analyzing the replays or just watching your teammates play other people and then like seeing what they could do better and helping them improve that type of stuff. Having teammates is really, really helpful. Like this is truly, even though it's an individual esport, um, teammates are so, so key uh, in helping each other improve. Uh, and then just being in a good clan system, playing lots of friendly battles, you know. Um, there are other stuff you can do outside, but that's for practice. That's uh, about it. Uh, Tag is a bad influence, just saying. <laughs> No, I, this is obviously obviously a joke that made me laugh though. Oh, so here's an important point. Um, do you recommend counting elixir all the time? I would say no, um, especially in double elixir. It's more at that point you you stop you stop counting because I would say you count a little bit. Like, like I said, it is a feel, but you also do count somewhat um, in single elixir. But in double elixir, no, you should stop counting. And yeah, it, early on, regardless of whether it's like um late game or not in a in a match early on it will make you worse if you're trying to keep track of uh, elixir and like trip interactions but you get better at it um and it becomes more of a passive thing that you do as opposed to like an active thought process but no you shouldn't really keep track and like double it becomes too tedious at that point you just try to make positive interactions i would say as opposed to just like i said positive uh elixir traits can be like not necessarily true. It depends on the situation. But uh, you, you learn to get better at it. All right, so here's one. He says, you know what? How to not screw up so bad when you don't have a good starting hand or the proper counter to your opponent right at the start will help. Blah, blah, blah. Um, how to keep your cool. I would say, like, go back. and So it's, a, it's all a learning process. So if you ever lose, like, two in a row, go back and watch the replays. Also, I like listening to music when I'm trying to, like, really win matches um and just focusing on that uh you can have end game sounds on they help a little bit i guess but i don't really care for them that much like i don't really miss anything anyway um but if you find yourself just like tunnel visioning i guess you can uh you can uh have end game sounds on as well but music helps uh, helps your focus um and then for not screwing up so bad when you have a good starting hand you have to think about like of course, you want to recognize what deck they have as soon as possible. Um, it just depends on what the hand is. So if you're like playing Golem and you don't have Pump, maybe cycle your like small spells. That's something you'll see pros do a lot. It's just cycle small spells. Um, but like, so let's say I'm playing a deck that doesn't have good log bait defense. You can't afford to cycle your log because then if they do have log bait, you just lose. Um, so it depends. Uh, if it's like a beatdown deck, you can just wait, of course. Most people know that. Um, but if you have like double spells, like... Uh, zap log then obviously you can cycle your zapper log and then just try to and then as soon as they start playing try to think of like what cards you need to keep in rotation because you'll like learn what their deck is as they play cards so that's about it i would say um so another person asked well you can't elixir in all the match or just only one elixir I, i'd say it, you you are still counting whether you're up or down and double like men, not mentally but like passively um but you're not keeping as close a count as in single elixir because you're you're more worried about playing things fast and just making sure you play well still. So you still punish elixir and 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 use elixir to your advantage in double elixir. Um, but it's n like like I showed in the Sergio example. But it's not necessarily as hard a count because you don't have as much time to think about it. Um, so someone else said, my problem is sometimes I don't know when I should play cards in front of a surviving troop. It just depends on like whether you're up or down, really. Like this is something that you should be able to do or learn how to do. And then if you're up, then it's usually a good idea. Um, but it depends. Like if the troop is so close to dying that it's like an e -whiz where it can just be logged and you're playing like a battle ram in front of it or something, then no. But if you're playing like a spell bait deck, maybe it's good to bait your log on something that usually isn't logged. Um, it, it's really situational. Um, some units are better counter pushing than others. If I have like a counter pushing ice whiz, it's kind of whatever. But if I'm playing a minor control, maybe I'll go with it. It just depends on uh, the unit, how effective it is on counter pushes, and then whether you're up or down. If you're down on a counter push, um, just let the unit. So if if like if it's a healthy unit and you're down an elixir, you let it go and let them defend it, and then you get to defend again. Um, and now you're probably even. Um, so it just depends. Uh, it's really situational, something you have to assess for yourself as you play. Uh, helping pros do it a lot. <clears throat>
Um, another person just recommended like card counting, uh, and but I don't want to make the video too long, so we'll make another one if uh, if that's highly requested. So and then just some people asking asking about Elixir Collector. So yeah, really with Elixir Collector, it's just as a punish. Um, a general rule of thumb, if you're punishing Elixir Collectors, you're the opponent playing against uh, someone else that has Elixir Collector, you're really going to want to go all in as soon as they play it because they're down six Elixir, right? So, like, if I'm playing Giant, I'm going to go Giant Mega Minion, then I'm going to Minor. <clears throat> or maybe not even like that because if I think they're playing through Musk, a lot of times what I do is I just go Giant first and then I wait a little bit and then I see if they're going to play, like, a Minion Horde and then I Fireball it and then I'll go Minor or something. Uh, or not even Fireball, but I'll play Mega Minion after the Giant. It just depends. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time, just pressure, throw stuff at it, throw stuff at the tower, be be aggressive, and then go for the pump. Um, or if you don't have that in hand, you just need to throw like a Fireball down on it. Uh, a really big rule of thumb, though, is never punish a second pump, because that means they're up in Elixir if you didn't punish the first one. Also, never punish like uh, the first pump with a Miner when the pump is already at like half its health because that means they're going to be back to another pump and then you're not going to have your punish so you have to save it so if you weren't able to punish the first one um with like a cheaper thing like minor then maybe save it for the second one definitely don't use it on the first almost expired pump um and then if you can always like fireball the second pump don't go into it because it means they're probably up uh, if they have the first pump still alive i mean um if you know that you're still even then you can punish or ahead then you can punish the next pump um, but yeah, I see too many people try to punish like the second pump when the first one is still up and you're down elixir So you really can't and now they're just gonna get to another pump because your punish is out of hand again It's a snowball effect. Um, something that three musk will try to make happen <clears throat> And then we already talked about like what you should do if you are the elixir collector player Someone said include what to do when you realize you have a lead. I think we did that already uh, Yeah, so I, I, I did um, he, he did specifically ask though if you're ahead by two using a golem deck and you have pump and golem in hand, what do you do against a non-minor deck? Um, so we kind of talked about, it, it depends on like how much you're up. So if I'm up only like two, then why not pump again, especially if they don't have a uh, pump in hand. But if it's already like double elixir, then you don't pump again because um, it becomes less of a factor at that point. You might as well golem and do what I did early, said uh, you could do earlier with golem against like bridge band, for example. It's uh, really circumstantial and it's something that you should, if you don't know what you should have done, then you should go back and watch the replay and try to assess the situation and learn from it. And that is it for the, the Q&A part. Um, thank you guys for watching. I think that is all. We'll see when I edit this, but, uh, I hope you enjoyed. Let me know if you like this type of content, like, and subscribe. If you do, um, let me know and I can do more in the future and I will see you next time. Coltown out.